I wish I could tell you that being a witch is exactly how it's portrayed on TV. When I was a little girl, I watched Kiki's delivery service for the first time, and I immediately turned to my mother and asked where my broomstick was. Kiki was my first awakening into my powers. I was seven years old when I sent a bowl of Choco Pops into my brother's face without using my hands. I wasn't a witch like Kiki, though. My family had a coven, so magic naturally ran through our veins. I could move things with my mind, and sometimes levitate objects if I tried really hard. My brother could generate light magic between his fingers, and with concentration, my sister could turn broccoli into ice cream. Now, this was the reality of being a young witch, a whole new playground to discover and figure out. The world felt almost tangible, like it was mine to contort between my fingers. Objects could fly, and animals could talk if I could find the right charm. When I started consuming witch media, I couldn't wait to receive my broomstick and find my feline familiar, but that's not what being a witch is. I was ten years old when I discovered my siblings and I would not live past the age of twenty-two, and Kiki's delivery service was just a human's fantasy of what a witch really was. I naively thought it was a natural half-witch's death, and I was weirdly okay with it. I'd rather die a witch than become a human. Thanks to my mother's subtle brainwashing, I was fully against leaving my coven behind. However, no, that wasn't it. Which is with siblings do live past the age of 22, only one can become a full witch. I was in denial, trying to convince myself that I would become human. My brother and sister weren't going to die, right? But where was that in my favorite movie? Mom broke it to me gently. The ritual is not a transfer of power. It is a fight to the death, and then a sacrifice. Only one of us would obtain our family's magic, carving it from the other two, and taking it for themselves. According to our coven, magic cannot be evenly shared between siblings, especially triplets. Magic cannot be transferred. Witches have tried in the past, with the result killing subjects and ripping covens apart. In witch media, magic is tangible. It can be molded and touched, appearing to the naked eye in colorful light. In the real world, magic is not a physical thing. We can generate light, but physical magic does not exist. It is entwined inside our souls, part of our beating hearts, and can only be stolen. Ripped from the soul of a dead witch. Magic must choose a dominating body and soul. For only children, they automatically become full witches when reaching adulthood, adopting their parents' power. But for us, becoming a full witch is a brutal fight. Magic does not choose a soul. It is up to the siblings themselves to decide who gets it. In our case, it's different. We were born in the exact same day, under the same moon, binding us to each other, our souls, and magic entangling. All siblings are given a deadline. If magic does not find a dominating body on their 22nd birthday, the magic returns to the parent, and the siblings become what is called empty. Uh, empty is neither human nor witch, a vacant shell drained of personality and thought. Empty can be twisted and contorted by what is called velvet magic, and be turned into soldiers, so they are put down before their bodies can be used. So, yeah. Either betray and murder my siblings, or become a mindless shell. When my mother was pregnant with us, she was advised to abort us. Twins and triplets are rare among our coven, but when they are born, their fates are already sealed to end in a bloodbath. With our magic split three ways, our lives were ticking time bombs. I would rather have been aborted in the womb than to be granted twenty-two years of life, only to have it ripped from me by my own blood. Mom, however, saw us less like her children, more akin to bulls in a ring. Mom had always been intense, obsessive with her family's power, and her place by our grandmother, the head of the Montgomery Coven's side. She wanted to see us fight for her magic, and for our right to stand as the surviving Montgomery witch. Mom wanted a bloodbath. She never saw me as a daughter. Instead, I was a tribute. As children, our bedtime story was her own ritual as an eighteen-year-old. 
Mom had two brothers. I don't know their names. She never talked about them like they were her siblings. Instead, she treated them more like contestants who she beat. I know the story so well, each detail ingrained inside my skull. I know exactly how she murdered them in perfect detail, reveling in their power and becoming a full witch. Unlike us, she wasn't a triplet or a twin. Her ritual wasn't taken as seriously as ours will be, so she could kill them and take their magic at any point. She killed one brother at his job, ripping his heart out, and the other brother at home, slicing his throat. Mom described it like it was a euphoric experience, that absorbing the power from her brother's dying corpse filled her with pleasure. Mom told us it was either her or them, but I couldn't take her seriously when her lips pricked into a smile, like just reminiscing about killing her siblings filled her with that phantom power she tore from them. It's not like we were quiet about the ritual. When we discovered what would happen to us, I thought it was a joke. I mean, I heard rumors about the Blood Witch's barbaric rituals, but they were like myths. Scary stories to frighten young witches. Blood Witches intentionally hurt humans for their own enjoyment. The Carlisle Coven are a well-known story. I used to have nightmares about them when I was a kid. Mom made it clear that because we were triplets and the stakes were higher, our ritual would be treated like a ceremony held on our 22nd birthday. My brother locked himself in his room for three days, and I made it clear I wouldn't be taking part. I tried to run away when I was fourteen. I say tried, because I got as far as West Virginia, searching for our human father. He ran away when Mom revealed her three children wouldn't live past the age of twenty-two. After some digging around, I found his name. Samuel Lockhart. He was human, and a professor according to social media. He didn't have a profile picture. Well, he did, but it was a robin on a snowy branch. It looked like he was a photographer, but I couldn't see any of his profile. What I did have was half of a physical photo. Mom tore it apart, so Dad's face was gone. Still, I could see the location, a towering brick building which could only be the college he worked at. I planned on starting there. When we were kids, Mom had forbidden us to talk about Dad, calling him a coward for running away from his own children. Dad just had common sense. He was a human who didn't understand the witch world, and I don't think he could deal with bringing up children who were destined to die. I got as far as the train station in Dad's hometown, oblivious that I was already being tracked down. Mom forced my brother to cast a teleportation spell, which she knew would drain him. And because our souls and powers are entwined, it would drain me, too. The only thing that does not affect us as a three is magic itself. If I were to paralyze my sister, and I have in the past when she's repeatedly stolen my clothes, and neither me nor our brother would be affected. However, if my brother was to cast a spell garnering colossal amounts of power, such as teleportation or soul transference, all three of us would be physically affected. We share things like tiredness and sickness. If they're sick, so am I. If my sister was coughing her guts up with the flu, or staying up all night to watch a new Netflix series, then all three of us paid the consequences. We shared each other's pain. When we were younger, of course, we took advantage. If the other two were annoying me, I pinched myself. When Callie fell off a bike, Eli and I felt the sting of her cut and the gravel stuck to her hand. I broke my leg falling out of a tree when I was seven, and all of us ended up in the hospital. It was my leg that was broken, but Callie and Eli could feel the electroshocks running up and down my knee. I had the stomach flu, and I felt the crippling nausea in my gut, but never actually vomited. Mom was smart. She didn't have to send our coven after me, because she already had her secret weapons. Eli and Callie. I made it halfway across the train station before my brain filled with fog. My arms dropped to my sides. My bag slipped off of my shoulder, and before I knew what was happening, I was on my knees. My eyes heavy, exhaustion slamming into me like tumultuous waves. I could feel him. Eli. 
His thoughts were fuzzy and distant, dancing across the back of my mind. Run. His voice was barely a whisper creeping into my skull. I couldn't run. I couldn't even move. My body filled with lead, which meant he had cast a spell powerful enough to drain all three of us. I was aware of people asking if I was okay, but my mouth wouldn't work. Every thought going supernova. I forgot why I was there, why I was running in the first place. I could sense Eli's agony and Callie's brewing panic attack. Mom was arming both of them against me. There were images in my head, flickers of past rituals I was forced to watch on Mom's laptop. I could see chunks of flesh, pooling red, splattered across a background that was either an average suburban home, or these witches had held their ritual in the middle of the forest, away from prying human eyes. I could still see it, what made me run away. The surviving sibling, a young girl, standing with her sister's severed head swinging from her grasp. Her smile was grotesque, a grin so evil, so twisted, I refused to believe she was part of our coven. The girl was painted, stained in the blood of her sister, and yet I couldn't see remorse or pain in her eyes, a flicker of regret or disgust. I only saw triumph. Her gaze burned bright, emanating the power she ripped from her siblings. I didn't want to become that. Burying my head in my arms, I didn't even have the energy to sob. I was curled up on the train station platform when my mother found me. I was shivering, my eyes half-lidded. There were two pairs of shoes in front of me. Mom and Eli. When I forced my eyes fully open, my brother loomed over me, hiding under dark brown curls as if in shame. I could still see the slight glow in his eyes from the spell, magic like stardust polluting his iris. Magic was supposed to be beautiful, but in my brother's eyes it resembled a force taking over him. His cheeks were ashy, eyes flickering open and closed, like he wasn't sure where he was. Eli shared my foggy brain and whirlwind thoughts, a gnawing, painful urge to just drop. He was swaying side to side like he would give in at any moment, release himself to the oblivion creeping inside his soul. Mom's fingers were wrapped around his arm to prevent him from collapsing, too. I already had an audience, and she waved them away with forced reassurance. Please excuse my daughter, she's a chronic narcoleptic. Mom laughed, scooping me into her arms. She treated the two of us to chocolate milkshakes on the way home. I thought it was an apology, but one look from my brother, idly slurping on his straw, told me she was just filling us with sugar to prevent us from passing out. Mom was too warm. When she carried me out of the car, my mom felt and smelled like home. Like my pillows and our kitchen. The flowers she decorated the walls with. Home. Ironic, because home stopped feeling like home after my attempt to run away. The Montgomery Coven cast a binding spell which imprisoned us inside the house. I remember it felt like being ripped apart. Like cold, heavy shackles tangled around my soul, biting into every nerve ending. The front door was now a luxury. If we wanted to go into the yard, we had to earn it. The only trips we made were with the coven, and I felt like a freak show, forced under a cloak, hidden from the outside world. The Montgomery triplets, I heard a human kid say when we strolled past them on their bikes. I bet they're witches. I started laughing and I felt Eli's frustration. I felt the sting of his fingernails carving half-moons into the flesh of his palm. I don't think my brother meant to send the kid flying off of his handlebars. He didn't even say the spell right, muttering it under his hood. After that incident, we weren't even allowed outside to see the coven. Mom homeschooled us, insisting that the human world was dangerous to a half-witch. A small cult of humans who were aware of our existence abducted half-witches and used them for their own personal gain. That is true. Half-witch abductions are fairly common. Still, though, Mom was using our fear of humans as an excuse to keep us from running away. It's not like we could, with the binding spell in place, but she was wary of the human world influencing us away from the coven. I don't want to call it brainwashing, 
But from the age of 14, we barely left the house, separated from our human and half-witch friends. From the age of 16, Mom started teaching us individually. My classes were on Monday night after dinner, while Eli and Callie's were on weekends. It was obvious what Mom was trying to do. She was already stitching the seed into our minds that our siblings were not to be trusted. That we were secretly conspiring against each other to take the Montgomery magic for ourselves. I admit, it did work at first. I was naive, oblivious of the coven's subtle mental warfare. When you're constantly enclosed with the same people, distrust fogs the air, twisting logic and bleeding into the back of your mind. Planting seeds that were already there, but now they're bigger, leaching into your thoughts. I became convinced Eli was secretly planning to kill me early, when he stopped talking to me, only communicating in one-word answers. Are you okay? I made the two of us coffee, and he poured his down the drain. Yeah. Eli wouldn't look me in the eye. What's going on? Nothing. Eli, talk to me. He shrugged, ducking his head. No. I started to lock my door at night, growing fearful of his eyes meeting mine, knowing one spell uttered from his lips would and could kill me. I was suddenly far too aware of the silverware on his plate at dinner, his Xbox controller when he was waving it around too much. I saw them as objects. Mom forbade magic being used inside of our individual classes, so he could kill me with his bare hands. I became paranoid. Suffocated with thoughts of Callie and Eli choking me in my sleep or slicing my throat with a kitchen knife. We were 17 years old when I became awake and aware of what our coven were doing. I almost killed my sister. After being driven mad by thoughts of my own demise at the hands of my siblings, I became withdrawn, obsessed with their every movement. I sat in my bedroom and stared at four walls, hyper-focused on my brother's footsteps in his room and the exact weight my sister put into her stride down the stairs. I didn't shower or eat. I planned, stayed up all night to devise the perfect murders. I studied my siblings' every move, finding weak spots and the best place and time to strike. With my sister, it had to be hard removal. Callie was a heavy sleeper, and I was sure if I kept quiet, I could sneak into her room and kill her before she could kill me. Eli was different. According to Mom, he was the weakest, magic-wise, but he towered over the two of us. I settled on slicing his throat. It would be quick and easy and painless. Mostly painless. What I didn't know was that my siblings had the exact same thought. I was so obsessed with winning, with surviving, I had no idea the feelings I felt. That paranoia tearing me apart. That thirst to kill was drowning them, too. Kill before they kill me. The night I planned to rip out my sister's heart, my brother was already hiding behind the door, a steak knife pressed to his chest. But Kaylee was waiting for us, her own knife clenched between her trembling fingers under the blankets. Eli struck first with the magic he wasn't allowed to use. It was a stun spell, sending me staggering back. I hit the ground, my vision foggy. Eli was already straddling Callie, teasing the blade into her throat. His teeth gritted. I saw Red, throwing myself onto his back, wrenching at his hair, my own knife grazing his Adam's apple. I had to win. The thought was choking our minds, drowning us. Winning was surviving. That's what Mom drilled into us. Grappling with our sister, Eli twisted around, already mumbling a spell he only knew half of, which turned my nose purple. It was so sudden, so ludicrous, for a disorienting moment, we stopped screaming and yelling at each other. Seconds passed, then a full minute. I was gasping for breath, blinking through tunnel vision, when my brother burst out laughing. The knife slipped from his fingers, and he flopped onto the bed, laughing into the pillow. Actually laughing. The kind of laughter that vibrated his whole body. I was caught off guard. Mom told me to strike first when they were least expecting us. I tried to, but the knife suddenly felt stupid in my hand, like a child's toy. That same hysteria slammed into me. And this time, 
It was lukewarm, waves pulling me down, enveloping my body. Dropping onto my knees, I was overcome with exhaustion, which quickly became almost drunk giggles I couldn't control. Callie relaxed, tipping her head back, eyes flickered shut. Mom, she whispered. Eli rolled onto his back, and after standing there hesitantly, I joined the two of them, squashing myself between them. Callie's bed was warm. I forgot what bed felt like. I had been sleeping on the floor for months, terrified of being murdered in my sleep. I felt at peace, finally enough to close my eyes and sleep for the first time in what felt like forever. When my brain filled with cotton candy, I dizzily counted the stars on Callie's ceiling. When we were younger, Eli promised us that he would paint the whole room with the galaxy one day, as soon as he got his full powers. Little Eli had no idea what those full powers inquired. Mom is fucking with us, he mumbled, cutting into my thoughts. He was still kind of giddy, so it was more of a sing-song. She told me you guys were acting suspicious, and to protect myself, Kelly hummed, lying in a halo of dark hair. Eli scoffed. Well, she told me I'm the weakest, and I have to watch my back around my powerful sisters. She's trying to turn us against each other, I said, parting at my purple nose. So killing each other will be less of a tragedy and more like a game show. Mom wants to be entertained. Kelly sat up, her eyes wide. So, she's been... Brainwashing us, Eli mumbled in Kelly's pillow. Mom almost had us. I almost killed my sister, and then my brother. Thankfully, though, we had each other. Mom had zero idea we were aware of her attempted manipulation, which made it more fun, I guess. Mom thought she was playing us, but in reality, we were playing her. The three of us gathered as much knowledge on magic, learning both from Mom and spellbooks we pulled out of the basement. First, we had to find a charm to break the binding spell, which was harder than I thought. In secret, we studied and searched for anything that would counteract what was holding us to the house. Maybe Mom subconsciously knew we were working against her, because every book containing counter spells was either destroyed or hidden. So, we looked for rituals instead. In the meantime, we made sure to act like we were falling apart, arguing in front of Mom, so it looked like she was winning. It had to be subtle, so it didn't look forced. We stopped talking, shoving each other out of the way. We argued over food, over who was emptying the dishwasher, and shower privileges. It seemed like normal sibling antics, except the satisfaction on Mom's face made me sick. She was reveling in our hatred for each other, even if it was fake. With Mom and the coven none the wiser, we looked further into rituals, mainly ones that required a human sacrifice. Blood rituals, bone rituals, anything that might free us. We memorized them. And as years went by, my siblings and I planned to escape. On the days leading toward our birthday, Mom became visibly paranoid that we were planning to run away. I mean, we were. Every time I walked past my brother, I gave him a nod, which meant things were still going to plan. Eli was in charge of our getaway car. Since the outside world was forbidden, we had to get creative. Matthew Stillbrook, an 18-year-old senior who lived down the block. There was nothing special about him, except his grandfather's baby blue truck. Blood magic was the only way to get Matthew Stillbrook's car onto our driveway. Mom took away our phones a few months before the ritual, so simply asking Matthew was out of the equation. Callie is the strongest out of us, so she used transference, which is basically body swapping, but it's done through blood. Well aware that Callie casting transference would wipe us out for at least a day, I knew we had to use it wisely. So, we waited until the day before the ritual. Mom was at the grocery store getting food, so we had maybe an hour. Callie sat cross-legged on her bedroom floor while I held her hand. When we were little kids, my sister had mastered transference easily slipping into the body of a volunteer, and then out again. This was different. This was a human, and humans aren't used to magic in their blood. If Callie fucked up, Matthew was dead, and so were our chances of stealing his truck. I can't actually tell you how Callie dealt with the spell. 
because five minutes in, Eli and I passed out before she could fully bleed into Matthew's body. I woke up in bed, maybe six hours later. Eli and a drained-looking Callie were sitting on my bed. All they had to do was smile for me to know Matthew's truck was ours. Before I could talk to them fully and go over the plan, the coven made a surprise appearance, blessing each of us and wishing us luck before plunging us into what they thought was a deep sleep. However, we were already 1,000 steps ahead. Eli knew about the sleeping spell, so he had used his last energy to cast a protection spell, which sent us to sleep, but not deep enough to render us helpless. Callie woke me up an hour before our 22nd birthday. The coven left us sleeping in the lounge, showering us with gifts and messages of good luck. I kicked the flowers and good luck cards out of the way, dropping onto my knees next to Eli. I was already foggy-headed from Callie casting transference. Matthew Stillbrook's body lay on the floor. Callie woke up two hours before us, creeping into his body and bringing him directly into our house. It's not like I wanted to make a human sacrifice, but you need to know we were trapped. Prisoners. If there was any spell that didn't take a human life, we would have used it. Unfortunately, though, our time was running out. It was either draw Matthew's blood from his body and sever the binding spell, or be caught and forced to brutally kill each other. Admittedly, I wanted to make the human sacrifice our mother, though it had to be someone with pure human blood. Mom still had Montgomery blood, despite her being human. I want to tell you about the blood ritual, but honestly, it feels wrong. I will say we said a prayer for the boy before my brother sliced his throat open. Blood rituals require an entire body. We spoke the incantation, and I watched blood run almost black across the hardwood floor. The ritual required witches to utter the spell until the sacrifice had stopped breathing. I remember squeezing my siblings' hands for dear life, my gaze flickering from the clock on the wall, ticking down to midnight, to seeping scarlet dripping from my fingers. Did it work? Kelly whispered, when Matthew's breath stilled. Eli lightly felt for a pulse that was no longer there. I, yeah, he said, I think. I didn't know what I expected. Maybe to feel like the suffocating weight on my chest had lifted, the invisible chains wrapped around my wrists to fall free. I didn't feel any of that. I felt the same. It was when I opened our front door and stepped over the threshold that feeling finally slammed into me. The cooling grays of night air tickling my face and blowing my hair back. The sky was inky oblivion above me, and it was real. The concrete under my feet, the bug scuttling across my bare arm. Real. For a moment, I was terrified. Twenty-one years of my mother's attempted brainwashing, isolating me from the human world. I took a step back, my mind snapping in two, a cry crumbling up my throat. I wanted to go back inside. I wanted to be sheltered from the humans who wanted my powers for themselves. But everything I had learned, I learned from the coven and my mother, the same people who were grooming my siblings and I into killers. I couldn't have jumped into the back of that truck fast enough. The seat was warm and cozy, and I pressed my head against the window, allowing myself to breathe. Eli took the front seat, and Callie sat in the back with me. Our destination was Dad's place in Virginia. Now we had an address. Before Mom took our phones away, I took the chance and sent him a friend request only for him to accept several minutes later, with a message detailing his address and phone number. I had them on a sticky note tucked into my jeans. Eli started the truck, and with a satisfying grumble of gears, we took off. The night looked so beautiful under our birthday moon that was approaching totality. I held the sticky note with my dad's address, clutching between my clammy fingers. Samuel Lockhart. He was human, so he would be safe. I wondered what he was like. Did he have kids? Did I have human step-siblings? I coughed. Something warm slipped down my chin. Dad would look after us. Outside, blurs of orange danced in the dark. I coughed again. Fire. 
I blinked, thinking it was far away. No. Figures coming towards us. Suddenly, something physical contorted my chest and stomach, my body writhing. I vomited lumps of thick red pouring from my mouth. This wasn't right. I sat up, the sharp movement sending electroshocks down my spine. Pressing my face against the window, the blurs of orange were growing brighter. I could see them, figures dancing between flickering flames. I knew it. The Montgomery Coven were a thousand steps ahead of us. Eli. I reached for the sticky note, grasping it tightly. What my hand found instead was a sticky wetness on the seat. I retracted my hand, an explosive cough sending red spraying into my hands. In the glow of a passing streetlight, my sister's head was pressed to the window. The foundation of bulging scarlet spluttering from her mouth, her body jerking. Shuffling back, I was already pawing for the lock on the floor. We learned of the crescendo spell as kids. Velvet magic is banned in the witch community, but it is still practiced in the shadows and can be easily learned. Crescendo was cruel, a subtle death sentence only noticed when it was too late. It could be cast silently, and with one simple word, you can liquidize the body of any living thing. I remember how Mom described it. She performed it behind a glass screen, popping the brains of a reptile. Little Callie screamed, and I shoved my head under the table. Eli started crying. He had already named the frog. Like being dragged through a meat grinder, children. Mom told us, a scary smile on her face. It is agonizing and a horrific fate, only to be used in means such as desperation or perhaps greed. I didn't understand her words until my shaky fingers found the warm, wet seeping down my chin. I coughed again. This time I couldn't breathe. In that fire, those fucking figures were closing in on us. Something is wrong. The words were in my mouth, my hands around our dead sister, who had vomited up her own internal organs, painting the car seat. Something is wrong. Eli. I spoke his name through a spluttery sob, my vision flickering. I could feel my brain leaking from my eyes in warm rivulets. I could feel my body coming apart, crescendo carving a hole in my soul. The truck came to a sputtering stop. I could see my mother's silhouette outside, her grinning smile. I had to stay awake. I screamed what was supposed to be a debilitating spell back at him. Except my mouth wouldn't work. Wouldn't form words. Shh. Eli murmured, tapping on the wheel. In the eerie orange glow from outside, I could see my brother's sly grin. The bastard really was a Montgomery witch. I'm waiting. Eli tipped his head back, lips tweaked into a smirk. His gaze trailed the sky, the moon we were born under. For what? I shrieked. My head hit the window with a thunk. Outside, our mother stood holding a flaming torch. A proud smile spread across her lips. Through tunnel vision, I saw my brother's sly grin. Midnight. Eli's fingers whitened around the wheel. I could see that glitter of magic, that purplish hue in his eyes. Midnight. When, per our mother's wish, he would tear my power from my soul. My gaze found the clock. 11.56. I wish I could tell you I secretly knew my brother would betray me. That he had been under our mother's spell since we were kids, molding him into the perfect fucking psychopath. But no. If I'm being honest with you, the steak knife tucked into my jeans was in case we were caught. It was a last resort. I never thought I would be using it on my own blood. Who wasn't as strong as me? As Callie? That's why Eli decided he was going to take it from us. After all, since when was he strong enough to kill two people? Callie was dead, and I was sputtering blood. My ears were bleeding, and I could taste shapes. But I wasn't vomiting my organs. 
1158. Two minutes to midnight. Twenty-two years old. I won't say I felt satisfaction when I plunged the blade of my knife into my arm. Eli cried out, my pain slamming into him. I had minutes, and within those minutes, I decided I wasn't going to take my brother's life with magic. I was aware of him lunging at me, with spells he barely knew, his teeth gritted, foaming from the mouth. A simple stun spell sent him falling back. I threw myself over the seat, and with him down, with his body paralyzed, I delivered the final blow, plunging the knife into his head. I felt the crunch of the teeth splitting his skull open, that one brief flash of indescribable agony, before he was gone. And so were his sensation, his feelings, his emotions. The bastard died with a smile on his face, which took me off guard. Midnight. No fireworks. No fucking cake. I was covered in my sibling's blood. A full witch. Just like all of those before me. Every witch who refused to kill for that power. I read that you're supposed to feel euphoric. Like the power is running through our veins, setting us alight. It didn't feel like that. It felt like the world was crumbling around me. My brother's blood was still warm on my hands. My sister's corpse lying across my knee. We were supposed to fucking escape. To win. I've been able to feel them my whole life. Their sensations and emotions. All of them. Now, I feel nothing. A cavernous oblivion dragging me down. When I crawled out of the car, I killed my psycho mother. I had to. You don't understand. She turned me into a killer. She was the monster inside my brother's head. The figures around her body didn't move, didn't speak. They stepped aside. They were smiling, their manic eyes drinking me in. I didn't know where else to go, so I went to my dad. When he opened the door, his eyes were squeezed shut. Like he knew one of us was going to come, but he didn't know which one. Dad didn't question the blood painting me. His smile melted my heart. He was so human, and that's what I needed. He led me into his kitchen, threw a blanket around me, and made me hot cocoa. Dad brought in a birthday card when I had showered my siblings' blood away. I tried really hard to not notice that my brother's name was originally written, and then scribbled out with mine. Dear Eli Willow, happy 22nd birthday. Love, Dad. I know you could do it, son, daughter. Hey, do you mind doing that favor I asked? The world feels strange. I don't feel like a whole person despite adopting my sibling's powers. When I clench my fist, Eli's light magic glows between my fingers. I should feel excited. I should feel that happiness, that choking euphoria my mother told me about. I don't feel happy, though. I feel empty, even as a full witch. I'm terrified of the Montgomery Coven. They already know where my dad lives. No cake, no fireworks, not even a cat. Kiki's delivery service lied to me. I just have a birthday card addressed to my brother, and magic I never wanted. Happy fucking birthday to me.